All right, so calculus 30. And uh, we have a section 1.2 that we're looking at here today. And 1.2 talks about the limit of a function, okay? Now we, we talked a little bit about limits yesterday. Uh, we're gonna talk about limits of particular functions. Now I have some questions to lead off this lesson here. And the one question is this, the first one. What y value does the function over here on the right equal when x equals four? This is a basic, basic question. And we understand from the, uh, from the equation, you simply put in uh, four in for x and you solve for y, y equals eight. Okay, we know that. We also can see um, on this graph, this yellow point, is the point where x equals 4 and that represents the point on this graph and we can see that y equals 8 right here this is y equals 8 okay so this is stuff that we know we know about this and in the past we've been focusing a lot on what does y equal when x equals something right x equals this y equals this we have an input value and we have an output value one input one output, right? This is what we've been focusing on. Well, now what we're focusing on is not necessarily what when x equals 4, what does y equal? Now we're looking at it this way. Think about this yellow dot that you see on the paper. This yellow dot, let's say this is covered up. And I don't know exactly what the graph looks like behind that yellow dot. When we're talking about limits, we're talking about language like what y value does the function approach when x approaches 4? So, so notice the difference there. So I'm going to zoom in just a little bit here so you can kind of see this. All right, I'm going to erase some of this stuff here. So as x approaches 4, let's just, let's just say x is approaching 4 from 2. So x is 2, x is 2.5, or x is 3, x is 3.5. As x approaches 4, what do the values of y for this function approach? So here are the values for y as x is approaching 4. And we can kind of see, if we translate this over to the y axis, we can kind of see that these values are definitely approaching 8. Okay. Now what I, what I did was I just conceptually, I looked at the graph, I'm like, okay, X is getting close to 4. I could do it from this way too, right? I could come back down to 4 this way. And here, here are the Y values on the graph. And it clearly, the Y values are clearly approaching this value, 8, all right? But notice I did not just substitute X equals 4 into the equation. I didn't do that. I covered up X equals 4 uh, on the graph. And I determined, you know, what the graph is approaching, see? It's a different mindset. Now, why is this important? Well, uh, this is important when we uh, have um, graphs that have values that do not exist in certain places, like gaps, right, or discontinuities. When we can't evaluate the function at a certain point, we can get information from around the point, okay? Now, I, I, did, I did just write down infinity here. I did want to talk a little bit about infinity here. Infinity is a very important concept in calculus. It's very, and I've mentioned this in pre-calculus, right? Infinity. We talked about, um, you know, as X approaches infinity, that means as it gets larger and larger and larger without bound, uh, this is infinity. So we understand infinity to be, you know, the far off distance, right? Where there is no end or time. Time does not end, right? Eternity, like inf infinity. But what about when we consider the distance between two points, all right? Because this is equally as important in the concept of infinity. In between two points, how many numbers are there? How many real numbers are there? Well, if we consider the points three and four, we can say, well, there's at least 10 different numbers I can think of, 3.1, 3.2, 3, you know. Well, why isn't there 100? Well, sure, there is 100. 3.01, 3.02, 3.03. And what about 1,000? Yeah, what about a million? We can always just add a number 
to the end of a decimal if three is at the beginning. So three point, we can add numbers in there and until infinity, right? And it would still be a number between three and four. So between two fixed points, there's also an infinite number of numbers. So this is gonna be very important to understand what we're doing here when we talk about limits of a function. We're actually trying to think about all of the, the infinite number of y values that lead up to a certain point. Where are they going to? What are they piling up towards? So it's not just one point, it's an infinite number of points that we're considering. It's just the one little, you know, space, okay? So we have a lot to work with. All right. Now, this is a different type of function you see on the screen here. And I just asked, what about this function, okay? Now, this is a rational function. You should know that. It's a rational function because we have a ratio of polynomials right so a division of polynomials and this graph looks like this now it looks very close to the graph that we just studied doesn't it it looks very close to this graph but it's it has a different equation so this is a rational function when x gets close to 4 or when x approaches 4 what does y get close to or what does y approach well if we take the same approach with the last question, I can see that certainly as x gets closer to 4, closer and closer, the y values get closer and closer to 8. From both sides, they both are approaching the same value, and that is 8. We get close as we, infinitely close. If we get infinitely close to x equals 4, what does y equal? y gets infinitely close to 8. So we still have a limit. This is very important. Even though we can't substitute straight in directly x equals 4 into the equation, because what do we get? Well, we get if we substitute 4 in there, 4 squared minus 16 over 4 minus 4, we get y equals 0 over 0. So it does not exist. y does not exist. And that's why we have this little circle, a little gap there, right? But if we're talking about a limit of function, a limit does exist. The value of y does not, but the limit does exist. Okay. So that's very important to understand. Here's another rational function, okay? Now, what do we know about this rational function? Well, it's a ratio of two integers. We have a linear sort of expression on top and a quadratic on the bottom. It appears that, and I'm gonna answer this question for you. <laughs> uh, what do we know about this function? It appears that we may be able to factor the denominator. And so I'm gonna rewrite this so we can rewrite this this is already factored on top. Uh, it appears that if we factor this uh, trinomial, that we're gonna have two binomials. X is going to be in the, the first term in each. Two numbers that multiply to positive three, add to negative four, it's gonna be minus three and minus one. So we can factor that. That's what I know about this. Also, we have some restrictions on X, don't we? The restrictions on X would be X cannot equal positive 3 or positive 1 because those x values make the denominator equal to 0 which is bad right so if x was equal to 3 I'm going to have some kind of problem I'm either going to have if you remember this from pre-cal 30 I'm either going to have a gap a hole like in this example up here or I'm going to have some kind of discontinuity like an asymptote or something all right and if you remember from pre-cal 30 hopefully you do but one of these is a gap. One of these, uh, I'm sorry, one of the, yeah, one of these is a gap and one of these is an asymptote. Do you remember which is which? Well, notice that when I simplify this, those two divide out to be one. Um, the function actually simplifies to one over x minus one. And I still have these as restrictions. Okay, so I can simplify this function. Now, if we have a restricted value that remains in the simplified version, that is a vertical asymptote, okay? So I know that at x equals one, I'm gonna have some kind of vertical asymptote. At x equals three, that's still a restricted value, but guess what? x equals three is not a restriction in the simplified, 
So x equals 3 is going to be some kind of discontinuity, and it's going to be a gap discontinuity. Now, I'm not going to draw this any further because I have it down below. But um, I don't know. Were there any other things that you thought about this function? I don't know. Maybe there were. You can tell me about that in the comments later if you want. So here's the function, okay? And I'm just going to scroll down here, zoom out a bit, and here's the graph. So at x equals 1, we do have an asymptote. At x equals 3, we do have a gap. And this appears to be sort of a traditional uh, sort of, you know, rational function, uh, the, the shape. And of course, notice that it looks just like this right here. Okay? That function is exactly what this looks like. Uh, except for the gap at 3. So if I had this function alone, it would look just like this, except it would be continuous here, because 3 would not be a restricted value in this function. But it is in the function that we started with. Okay. So this is what the function behaves like. Now I want you to notice here, with the concept of the limit here, I have two charts. And as x approaches 3 from the left, now this is the left side, isn't it? It's approaching 3 from the left here. And so at 2.5, the value of the function is 0.6. At 2.9, the value of the function is 0.526. As we get closer, as we get really, really close to 3, notice that f of x gets really, really close to, it looks like, 0.5. Now from the other way, from the right side, as we approach 3, these values are climbing just ever so slightly. And what are they climbing towards? Well, 0.4 turns into 0.47 to 4.9 to 4.99 to 4.9999. So this clearly seems to be getting closer to 0.5 as well. And so even though in this original function I cannot plug in x equals 3, to get an answer, notice this, very important. I could plug in x equals 2.9999 and get a value. I could plug in 3.0001 and get a y value. It's just not at exactly 3. Now to further, um, to further display this, okay, to show you this, uh, I do have a graph up here, okay? Now let's see. Uh, this function right here, okay, is, I don't know if you can see this on the left of your screen, but it's y equals x squared minus 16 over x minus 4. Okay, so I've got a equals 4 here, x minus 4. So we've got a rational function that behaves like a straight line. And actually it looks just like this straight line right here. Oh, this is this, I did this one. Okay, so it's this one right here. So I've got this up on Desmos, okay. Um, now, it looks like a solid line, doesn't it? It looks exactly like a solid line. But at x equals 4, we know there's a problem. So here's x equals 4, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in, okay? Notice as we get closer and closer, it still looks like it is continuous, like there's no disruption at all. Yet this is a rational function. And x equals 4 is a problem. So look what happens when I get super zoomed in. Now, this is zoomed in incredibly millionths of a, of a unit. So look what happens here. At x equals 4, the function is undefined. Undefined. Now I'm zoomed in so much that if I run my, my cursor even up here, it's still so close to 4 that it can't uh, determine what the value is. But if I zoom out, if I zoom out, see those two points are coming in? I can actually get oh, Oh, look at this. It kind of helps me with a limit. <laughs> it shows a limit there. That's 4. If it approaches 4, it approaches 8. So if I come back out here, come back out here, way out, that point seems to be gone. But look at 4 is undefined. See that? But the limit, if you, if you look at that graph coming in like this, the limit is 8. Okay? So... The graph, oops, I should mention too that the graph looks like a straight line if you can uh, simplify out some binomials. And if the simplified version just looks like a linear equation, then your graph is going to look like a linear graph. So that's something we also studied uh, in pre-cal 30, if you recall. So.
So, okay. So it looks like a line here. Um, if if A here wasn't four, I'm just going to do this uh, for you to show you. If A wasn't four and we couldn't divide out that x minus four from this, then and I'm going to move that right now. Look what happens. See, it doesn't turn into a straight line. Like it doesn't simplify to just x plus four. It it's it remains a rational, and we've got all sorts of discontinuities um, and that sort of thing. Okay, uh, so so yeah, if you can divide out a binomial, uh, then it's going to look drastically different. Okay, do you guys have any questions for me right now? So how do we write this? How do we show what's happening here? Well, remember this limit notation from yesterday? Okay, this is what we would write. We would write, even though we do not have a value of y at x equals three, we can write, we can show that the limit of this rational function as x approaches three does in fact have a limit or does in fact have a limiting value. And that value here is for this, uh, this equation right here, and this is this is the graph I have, right? Hmm. Oh, that shouldn't be one. I'm not sure why that is. That should be a three, right? That's what looked funny. So this is this graph right here. So the limit as x approaches three is 0.5, okay? It should be noted that f of three here is undefined. So there's your comparison. x equals three has no partner y value. x approaching three has a limit. It's 0.5. Okay, so the limit function here, uh, the limit notation goes like this. The limit of f of x as x approaches a equals l. That would be the limit, okay? And this can happen anywhere on a graph. It doesn't have to happen at a, uh, a gap. It can happen on a continuous part, okay? The only place we run into trouble, well, one of the places we run into trouble is when we have a jump discontinuity, and you'll, we'll talk about that in the next section, or when we have an asymptote. So watch this. What's the limit of the function as x approaches one? Well, the graph doesn't seem to be approaching any value. It seems to be racing up towards infinity. And as x approaches one from this side, x seems to be racing in the opposite direction towards negative infinity. So it is not settling in. It is not settling in on one point. It's not pointing towards one point. It's going in the opposite direction. So there's no limit there, okay? No limit there, all right? Okay. All right, in section 1.2 as well, we have properties of limits. I'm not gonna talk too much about all of the properties of limits here just because right now this is still fresh, okay? We're gonna come back to this, but certainly on page, I don't know what page is it on in your textbook here, page 13, 13, you have a chart of properties of limits. Now, um, if we take a look at the very first property, okay, uh, and we take a look at this polynomial, all right, uh, we can find out what the limit is by A, looking at the graph, I suppose. That's a, number one. I've got the graph down here. We can find out what the limit is. But algebraically, how we do this is a, um, uh, so if, if we're trying to find a limit of a polynomial, we can find the limit of all of the terms in the polynomial separately and either add or subtract them to get the limit of the entire polynomial. So I can, and I'll show you that in a second, but that's, that's this is rule number one. So let's figure this out. Um, polynomials are nice to work with because they are continuous. All polynomials are continuous. They do not have any gaps or jumps or asymptotes at all. So that means that every point will be defined and also there's no real tricky, real, real tricky um, things you need to visualize. And as a matter of fact, limits for polynomials are really easy. So I'll show you this. On the graph, this question says, what is the limit of this polynomial, x squared plus 2x minus 3? It's a parabola. I've got it pictured here. I've got it spread right out so I can see what x equals 5 is. 
Uh, and what, what's, the, uh, what's the limit? Now, I'm going to look at the graph first. I'm going to use the properties of limits in a second. Using the graph, I go over to x equals 5, and I take a look at this. Now, I go and look at the graph, and I'll zoom in. I made it pretty small. I'll zoom in, and it looks like, okay, if I look at this graph, it looks like the graph is definitely approaching this value right here, which would be, you know, f of 5 right here. Now, f of 5 exists. It's an actual number. And because polynomials are all continuous, guess what? We can actually substitute in the value into the polynomial to find the limit. So I'll say that again. Because polynomials are continuous, and because one point leads to the very next point and there's no like big crazy gaps or jumps that if you just substitute the x value into the polynomial whatever value you get there will be the limit so what i'm saying is that f of five will be equal to the limit of the function as x approaches five and that's for polynomials so let's use the properties of limits to explore this algebraically, okay? So properties of limits, here we go. Let me get back to 100% view here, where are we? Here we go. Okay, using the properties of limits. So this is the first big thing that we need to understand, that the limit of this polynomial is the same as this, the limit of x squared as x approaches five, plus the limit of two x as x approaches five minus the limit of three as x approaches five okay so watch what happens um let's say we take a look at this so if we have just a regular old x squared as x approaches five x squared approaches 25 right because it's continuous you can simply substitute so if you're finding the limit, it's the same as f of 5. So it's x squared or 5 squared, 25. Okay, that's this. And if you, if you were to graph this, you know, if you were to graph this, right, you, you, would, you would see that. Okay, now what about the limit of 2x as x approaches 5? Well, because this is a polynomial, a monomial is a polynomial, I can simply plug 5 in there and the value would be 10, and because it's continuous, the limit is also 10. So 2 times 5 is 10, which is also the limit. Now, the limit of the function y equals 3, you got to remember that that's just a horizontal line. So as x approaches 5, this function is just going to be 3. All right, so it's just 3. So what do we do? We do 25 plus 10 minus 3. And because each of those individual limits can add up uh, according to the properties of limits, and because it's a polynomial, you can simply substitute the value in. The value of the function will be the same as the limit of the function. Polynomials, awesome, okay? So what's this, 35, 32? 32. So this value should be about 32. Um, I can't really tell, what have I got here? One, two, three, four. 20 yeah 32 okay 32 and also the limit here of the of the graph you can see that it approaches that value right so if we if you substitute a number in to a polynomial or even a rational because if you notice here even a rational function has lots of places where you know one part of the line is leading right to the next part of the line it's continuous in a lot of places so you can usually substitute the value into limits to find the limits because the value of the function at x equals a if this was x equals a is oftentimes the limit of the function okay and we'll talk about some uh, some exceptions to that rule um, here right away now okay so here I just made a note here because the function is continuous that means it's got no jumps gaps asymptotes because it's a polynomial the limit of f of x is the same as if x was equal to 5. So the limit of f of x is equal to f of x. All right. Rule number 5 in the properties of limits. Okay, property number 5 here. Okay, a little bit tough to maybe uh, to understand if you just look at that. It looks really gross. But let me explain this to you. 
what this is saying is that if you have a rational function and you're taking the limit of a rational function, okay, what you can do is you can take the limit of the top function and you can evaluate the limit of the bottom function and then you can just find the ratio of those two and that's your limit. Except, except if the limit of the bottom function is zero. So if it's zero, we got a problem and then you can't simply do that. So, so watch what happens here. We have to do some fancy kind of manipulating of our, of our function. So if I were to think, well, maybe this graph is continuous at x equals four or near x equals four, I'm just gonna try to substitute. I'm gonna try to substitute and find out what f of four is for this function right here. So I'm gonna see if f of four gives me my limit. Okay, so f of four, actually, let me just do this all at once. So f of four would be four squared minus 16 over four minus four. Oh boy, f of four, you see right away we've got zero over zero. So that's a problem, can't just substitute. That means that we've got some kind of discontinuity there and the limit is, is gonna take a little more work. But what we do here, is this, and this is really important. When we come across something like this where plugging in x equals four is definitely gonna give us a problem, then we factor both the top and the bottom and reduce the rational expression first. If we do that, we might be sort of getting rid of the factor that's the problem. And why is that okay? Well, because this graph, if it can be simplified, actually exhibits behavior of a different looking graph. And so we can find out what the limit of that function is if we can change it in its form to a function where that f of four exists. That's a, that's a bit wordy, but just watch, just watch. So this function, I've graphed it. Um, uh, you've seen the graph. And I know that I have a problem at x equals four. Okay, but if I reduce this, so x squared minus 16 over x minus 4. If I rewrite that as x plus 4 times x minus 4, because that's a difference of squares, is why we practiced our difference of square factoring, then I actually see that, oh, boom, boom. I actually see that this really behaves like x plus 4. And that's just a straight line. And so in x plus 4, there are no gaps. And so I can now go ahead and substitute 4 in for x, and I can find out what the limit of the original function would be. So that's how you get around it. You try and um, factor and divide out common factors and manipulate your equation a little bit, just like we did pre in pre-cal 30 there when we uh, were proving identities, remember that? We changed them into something else, we manipulated them, we multiplied top and bottom by something, we uh, you know changed it around a bit. So this is what we're gonna do. So if the graph looks like x equals four, I can now plug in four into this, and that gives me eight. And guess what? This is actually the limit, and we've found it now algebraically. So let me find that graph for you again. That graph is up here. Um, oh, right here, okay. All right, so this graph right here, that's, this, is the, this is the graph. And it's definitely got a gap there, so if I plugged four in there, I'd have a problem. But because this simplifies to y equals x plus four, which is really what this line looks like without the gap, I can now plug four in, and this line is going to yield me eight. And that's gonna tell me exactly what the limit is, okay? So we factor, rearrange, and then we substitute. So when you're finding the limits of a function, two things to remember, okay? Kind of, we're getting to the end of the lesson here. Two things to remember. If you're trying to find the limit of a function, substitute the value that x is approaching. Substitute that into the function. If you get a number, chances are, that's gonna be your limit. If you get zero over zero or some number over zero, you've got a problem. And you're gonna to have to factor and rearrange a little bit. So this one right here, remember we did this? We factored it, we rearranged, um, and then we actually would be able to calculate a limit at three, okay? Okay, because if I put three in here, I'd have one over three minus one, one over two, which is 0.5. I'll say that again.
This is the simplified version. So if I plugged in f of 3 now, I have 1 over 3 minus 1, which is 1 over 2, and that is my limit. Voila. Okay, so here, here's some practice, um, and um, here's some practice for you. This is number four, so here's your assignment below here. Um, this is your assignment for 1.2. It's, it's also posted other places, but this is number four from your assignment, and what I would like you to do is I would like you to, um, let me just see here, what is question number one and two all about? Okay, one is using a graph uh, to determine limits, and I'll just go to do do do. Let's see. Oh, this is one three I've got on right now. So uh, here we go. So number one is looking at this graph and determining what the limits are if they exist. Number two is state the value of the limit if they exist for just monomials and number three and four are trinomials and rationals and polynomials of different types and so uh, number four is the basis of this lesson if you need you need to know how to do questions for number four so i'll get you to pause right now and i'll get you to um, do questions one and two and uh, four and uh, i'm gonna be available to answer questions from my class here that are on with me right now and I will show you some answers to some of these in a little bit but that is uh, that's the lesson for section 1.2 all right so that's the lesson for 1.2 uh, I hope that uh, I hope that you uh, have a great time doing this uh, and you understand see ya